Hello and welcome to this event from the Bristol Ideas and uh, the Festival of the Future City. I'm Jenny Lacey and today we're visiting Ravenna to find out what we can learn from the great cities of the past. Judith Heron is a writer and academic who's worked around the world and is currently visiting senior research fellow in the classics department at King's College in London. She's won much praise and prizes for her work on the early medieval Mediterranean world. And her latest book on Ravenna is the result of nine years of meticulous research and scholarship. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So Judith, welcome. Thank Just you. explain to me, please, why Ravenna is not so well now, known now, given how enormously important and indeed beautiful it was in the past. I think one of the reasons is that when we think about it, Italy, we and cities in Italy, we think about the Renaissance, we think about Rome, we think about Florence and Milan, and these were the great centres of culture which gave us an art that we all admire and enjoy looking at. And what we forgot uh, in that process was that well before the 14th, 15th century, there was a great civilization in Italy and it was the Christian civilization of the very early period when Ravenna was the capital of the Western Roman Empire and it, the emperors and the rulers that lived there built fantastic palaces and churches and decorated them in mosaic. And this was a new, relatively new art form that the Christians used to great effect to make very, very beautiful churches. But after the eighth and ninth centuries, Ravenna fell into a decline, which meant, and it was in effect, in effect replaced by Venice, which did not exist before about 800 AD. And so in the process of transference, Ravenna became another small city with beautiful churches and palaces, palaces falling into ruin, but churches well preserved by the clergy who continued to serve in them, which is why we have this astonishing collection of early Christian monuments in a very unknown and relatively neglected city that fell into a decline or just sort of um, retreated from its prominence and was taken over by the great cities that we now think of as representing Italian civic culture. You describe it as an extraordinary delight. Uh, would you tell us about your um, kind of delight, but enormous amount of hard work when you started to research it? Because of course it is so early and there aren't the kind of documents available that there are for the later cities, the, the cities that, that came to prominence later, like Milan and, and Venice. Yes, this is what one of the problems. And I think um, I was particularly sparked by the representations of the Byzantine emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora in the apse area of one of the big churches at Ravenna San Vitale, which is itself a very strange and unusual church on an octagonal base with a high dome, features that were not common in Western architecture in the sixth century. And I thought, why are they there? And what are the sources that would tell us about that, uh, their presence? And of course, there is a, a, a history behind their, their, um, the armies that conquered Ravenna from the Gothic kings in 540 AD. But nonetheless, there wasn't very much explanation about the previous history and the other monuments of the city. And as I began to look, I discovered that there were also extraordinary records on papyrus, which is a very flimsy material, not like parchment made from animal skin. Papyrus is made from reeds bound together, and then scribes would scratch on the reeds with their charcoal paste ink with, with feather pens. I mean, it was, it was quite hard making these records, and they are not well preserved. But thanks to the great work of a, a, a wonderful papyrologist, uh, Jan Olaf Geda, we have an edition of the, the surviving papyri written in Ravenna. And that gave me the entrance that I was looking for to the people who lived in the city, not just the rulers, but the actual 
ordinary people who signed documents, who witnessed the deeds of gifts from other friends to the church or adoption of children or their heirs and all the sort of normal everyday um, legal material that was not preserved on parchment. And that was just a, a great discovery for me. And it, I think it makes the book come alive because you can see that these are not very important people frequently, but they're taking a lease on a pond here or a for bit of forest there, and they're building a house on a bit of land that they've inherited. And there are women there too saying, I inherited this from my father, don't you dare take it away from me. So you get a sense of everyday life and the way people lived in Ravenna in these centuries, which was which made, made it easier for me. Take us back to the beginning then and the decision to go to Ravenna. Uh, why was it chosen? Why, why was it such a, a useful city to go to? And, and why did they go there? The Emperor Honorius had been besieged in, the, in his capital city, Milan. And Milan had been a very, very large city, not quite as big as Rome, but still very large. And he simply didn't have enough men to man the walls, to defend the circuit of the walls in the late uh, fourth and early fifth centuries. And because the Huns and the Visigoths had been attacking particularly the Visigoths had been attacking this city and looked very successful and were capturing other cities. His advisors suggested that they should seek a more easily defendable city. And they went to the Delta of the Po, um, which is an enormous Delta with lots and lots of rivulets going down to the Adriatic Sea from this great river that runs right across Italy and up into the Alps. And they chose a very marshy area where Ravenna was sited because it was considered very difficult to besiege. And I've now learned that these areas of refuge in the deltas of big rivers that in the Danube uh, and in the Rhone, there are many places where people who were frightened of being invaded or captured sought a refuge because they knew they could hide or they could defend themselves in this very watery um, environment where it was quite difficult to bring up um, cavalry or cannon or, or not cannon, of course, but nonetheless siege weapons. So they did they sought a refuge and they found a very well-built city, small, but with strong brick walls and a good triumphal gate and all the amenities of a small Roman city, theatres, temples, etc. And Honorius uh, decided to move his capital from Milan. And by the end of the year 402 AD, he was settled there and was minting coins in his name from the mint in Ravenna. So he, it was partly to get away from the hordes of, of enemies, but it was also, I think, partly because he was terrified that Milan would be captured and therefore the whole culture of the Roman capital would be destroyed, its record keeping, its tax um, capacity, all those things that made the empire function so well. And he just said, we will all move to Ravenna. And I think most of them put their goods on barges and gently moved down the Po until they got to the river, to the tributary, which took them right into Ravenna, because it was deep, it was immediately connected to the River Po. Must have been an extraordinary sight. Oh. Would that there was video. Can you imagine watching it? It just must have been wonderful, mustn't it? So take us to Ravenna in its absolute heyday, uh, where there was this wonderful mix of secular and Christian, uh, uh, because Christianity took such a stronghold so quickly, didn't it? Um, such a, a mix of beautiful buildings. What what was it like? Was it built on a was it built on a plan? Was it what were the streets like? Did it have the the Italian or the, or the Roman one should say drainage systems and all those sophisticated things they liked so much? Um, well, it was basically just like Venice, built on sandbanks. And so most of the roads were probably canals, narrow canals, and then slightly broader ones. 
there were Roman roads because we know that there was uh, an access to the sea where there was a very important port, Classy, and uh, that was the harbour for the East Mediterranean uh, Roman Navy. Um, and there were roads, of course, but they'd been built up on these sandbanks in the middle of the marshy, very watery environment. And quite a lot of the streets must have been actual canals, like in Venice. And so they went around on their barges, punting around on their barges in these narrow, uh, not very deep canals. And they did indeed have a water system and a sewage system, but it was regularly fouled up by very heavy silt coming down from the Po every spring and rather blocking up their sewage systems and messing up the water supply. So the Gothic king Theodoric rebuilt the aqueduct and made sure that fresh water did come into the city. Uh, and then in the middle of the sixth century, we find the great reconstruction of an imperial Roman city after the Gothic occupation with the transference of all the Gothic churches to uh, the Catholic use, because the Goths were an Arian Christian They'd adopted Aryan Christianity, which was condemned as a heretical form. And they built more churches and invested in a lot of very magnificent buildings. Sadly, most of the secular ones have not survived, but we have the great churches. So let's talk about some of the very important people because there's some very colorful characters and you do a wonderful job of, of bringing them to life and I have to admit um, that one of my favorites is uh, Gala Placidia is who knows how you pronounce it but um, a woman who'd, who'd had a, a colorful backstory and then fetched up in Ravenna and uh, and was very influential just yes. just paint a picture of her for us but she was a much younger half-sister to the Emperor Honorius. So we know that she, they shared the same father, Theodosius I, who was a great emperor, a great military leader, a Roman emperor in the, in the traditional style. And she must have been born in Constantinople, but had been sent to Rome when her father died. Her mother died even before that. So she was an orphan from the age of about three, and she was brought up in the household of uh, her, uh, 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 what relation was she to Serena? He was an adopted daughter of Theodosius. They were, they were all part of the family in an extended family background, and she and her half-brother Honorius, who was a bit older than her, must have known each other very well in their Roman and Mil Milanese, because they, they, they had a palace in Milan when he was young. So they were brought up together in the Roman tradition. And I presume that she was educated in the way that most children of the imperial family would have been. She had to know Greek and Latin. She had to read the basic histories. She had to know the basic poets. She understood Roman culture. But at the time when the Visigoths were besieging Rome, uh, she was captured, and we don't know why or how this was allowed to happen, but she was actually taken prisoner by the Goths and held as a sort of trophy after the sack of Rome in 410 AD. And she accompanied the Goths with other members of the Roman Senate who had also been captured. They must have all traveled in wagons, I guess. And they were Tra they traipsed around Italy and over the Alps into southern France, Gaul, and there eventually she was married to their leader. We don't know whether that was by choice or fait accompli. And then they gave birth to a son who was called Theodosius after his Roman grandfather. And great hopes were pinned on this child, but sadly he died and was buried somewhere near Barcelona. She was then an absolute victim of the Gothic struggle for power between different factions and had a very miserable time, I imagine, until her half-brother Honorius sent ambassadors to buy her back. And eventually she was brought back to Rome and there she was forcibly married. And we are told this was against her will to one of Honorius's distinguished generals. And then she had two more children. But eventually he died, her second husband, 
and widowed again, she set up uh, her base in Ravenna to protect the, the claims of her son, Valentinian. While he was a small boy, uh, he'd been installed as emperor after the death of Honorius, but he was obviously too young to do any ruling. And I suppose there were many, many people involved in a sort of council of regency, but she appears to have taken a very powerful role and she built to suit the new capital of Ravenna to give it the monuments that it needed. Big churches, a very beautiful mausoleum, which has her name, although she was not buried there, she was buried in Rome. But she is a very major figure. And I do see, I do think that she had a very important role in preserving um, imperial power in the West at a, in the fifth century when, you know, there were lots and lots of invading uh, different tribes coming into Italy, trying to take control of the Roman Empire. And she held out in Ravenna and her son inherited his power and became emperor as Valentinian III. So that was a success, but she was a great patron of the arts. Let's talk about um, everyday life because uh, there, there presumably were quite a big middle class. I mean, there would have been the, obviously the people living in the palaces, the, the relations of the rulers and the emperors and all the rest of it, but there were shopkeepers and there were uh, traders and merchants and all sorts of people. Uh, and they certainly liked enjoying themselves, didn't they? Oh, yes. They had a very uh, high standard of living by fifth century, sixth century standards. And I think this was partly because through the port of Classe, they were intimately connected with the East Mediterranean. And we know that they imported silks and soap and spices and all those good things, jewels and things that came from even further east. <clears throat> Many of these came through Alexandria, others through Constantinople. But with the naval communication, they had direct access. And from Constantinople in particular, they derived a sense of imperial style, dress, manner, diet, doubtless, and all the other good things that are associated with uh, a very imperial uh, courtly life. But I think in addition, they also had um, uh, ways to develop the court in Ravenna, which were different from other courts. They were, they, it was a much smaller uh, city, but it had a very high concentration of extremely educated and cultured people who had a, a developed taste and appreciated things like the wild asparagus, which was said to be very much tastier than the grown cultivated asparagus, things like that. And in addition, they all wanted to wear very fine silks. And there were, of course, uniforms, not just for soldiers, but for all the courtiers who assisted in the arrangement of the emperor's bedroom and his wardrobe and his imperial costume that he had to wear on formal occasions, jewels and orb and scepter and all the rest of it. So there were a lot of very cultivated people uh, and the court attracted all the talent um, in northern and even further afield in other parts of Italy. Uh, and they came to Ravenna to get jobs. And so there was an enormous influx of useful, of people who thought they could be useful, who sought jobs. And some of them, of course, were shopkeepers, shipbuilders, people with craft skills, the man who made linen breeches, sort of trousers that were worn by some people, not by Romans who were still in togas and tunics, made of silk, decorated with gold embroidery and fixed with jewels. <laughs> All that went on in Ravenna, and we only have a, an inkling of it from the papyri, but we can see it in the mosaics. There they are wearing their, their, their bling. And when they went out to enjoy themselves, uh, they, presumably they had moved past gladiators. What sort of things were there? Were there auditorium? Did they do plays? Oh, yes, I think they did plays. There was a theatre and I think they did a lot of music. We hear about the children singing and we know that, for example, the entire population was sent out of the city in a procession to greet their new bishop when he came back from Rome, where he had to be uh, properly consecrated. 
and we hear that the children led the procession singing hymns and they all welcomed their new bishop back into the city because of course they were a bit fed up that he had to go to Rome to be consecrated by the Bishop of Rome. This was a subjugation that they felt very made them inferior, but they wanted to celebrate. And they did indeed celebrate, they celebrated victories. Some of them may have been, you know, traditions of a mythic nature, but we learn that on one occasion they celebrated on St. John's Day in June, they went out and they decorated the city as for Easter. And they all processed around celebrating the fact that on that day they had defeated the Greeks. <laughs> this is a reference to the navy that had come from uh, Constantinople and tried to capture the city. So there were these sorts of collective uh, activities. And I think um, the, the countryside around Ravenna is uh, is. is of course, now it's a lot of this area has been reclaimed, but it was very close to the sea. And so they would go out on barges to go hunting and, sh and find ducks to eat and fish and so on. And then the children, we know, played outside the city walls with their wheels, with their uh, um, these well toys that they took with them uh, and and. Uh, and they clearly they all enjoyed uh, a, a life of, of relative security and uh, entertainment, probably more dominated by the court, where there would have been poetic uh, competitions, speechifying, musical entertainments, feasting. Um, the, the bishop built himself a magnificent dining hall with many, many uh, 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 areas where you could put up couches because of course they still reclined to eat in the Roman style four or, four or five people on a couch and then we hear that the children brought in or the, the pages the servants brought in these great golden dishes and they were full of all this wonderful food uh, that they ate um, so that there was a very strong sense of enjoyment of big meals and feasting doubtless well, drinking too. I imagine. Uh, you, you talk about security and it's a, it, again it's an extraordinary picture because for these four centuries-ish that Ravenna was so powerful, um, you know, the, the, inside the city all of this was going on that you described, but outside were these extraordinary marauding tribes, wars, battles. Uh, so did it did the, did the men go off from time to time and I mean just just describe how that happened and what was going on outside Ravenna. Outside Ravenna, Italy was in turmoil from the early fifth century right through till the end of the eighth. The conquest of Charlemagne in seven seventy four was a decisive moment when a more orderly system of government was imposed at least on the north. In the south, the duchies of Benevento and Spoleto had established Lombard principalities. And around Rome, um, the bishops of Rome were very busy accumulating estates that they could call their own, where they could call on resources to feed the people of Rome and the clergy. Um, which became the, the, formation, the foundation of the papal states in the center of, of Italy. But in other parts of, of the West, uh, tribes changed, I mean, the territory changed hands quite frequently. There were numerous battles, numerous new invasions, and often great uh, destruction. Uh, which was continued by the Vikings later. I mean, it's, it's a, this per period of medieval history is not peaceful at all. And it was not peaceful, I'm sure, in Ravenna. We know the city was besieged by the Lombards frequently, but it, built, it, it beat off most of the uh, attacks. And although Classe, the harbour, was uh, attacked and captured, it seems that, and that was also a fortified city, it seems that it was regained fairly speedily, and it was only in 751 that the Lombards actually captured Ravenna definitively, and that was the end of the uh, of official government from Constantinople, which had been the uh, in place since um, the late 6th century um, under these 
a series of governors called exarchs who were appointed from Constantinople for a limited period and came to live in Ravenna and uh, imposed a, a very imperial style of government. Describe it as such a lovely word. You described it as the hinge uh, between East and West. Could you just talk a little bit about the, the difference between uh, the East and West and, and what was happening in art and culture and that kind of thing and, and, and how it influenced what was going on in Ravenna? Ravenna benefited from this very direct link with Constantinople, which kept it abreast of all the developments in Greek culture because in the course of the sixth century, Latin gradually fell out of use in the East Mediterranean and Greek, which had been the lingua franca for so many centuries, just became dominant in the imperial circles, in imperial circles, as well as among the general population. We know that some of the individuals who witnessed um, papyri, uh, signed their names in Greek using the Greek la language. And some of course were still signing in Gothic because there were people who had spoken Gothic all their lives. They were the Goths, they had their own language and they signed using Gothic, which is another language altogether, which I do not read. <laughs> but um, Ravenna constantly had this input of Greek culture. And so it knew about what the the imperial court in Constantinople, the new Rome, the real center of Roman power was doing in the way of, patr of, of patronizing new poets, new art forms, new architecture, the great church of Hagia Sophia built by Justinian. And that notion of legal tradition, uh, medical traditions, sense of historiography, how to write your own history, how to understand uh, Christianity, theology was very, very important. And so these things came from the East where everything was becoming nearly all written in Greek. And it came to Ravenna where quite a lot of it was translated into Latin. For example, in the medical schools, we know that there was a Greek doctor and there were Latin doctors. So the Greek doctors presumably used the Greek texts and the doctors of the Western school used the Latin translations. But there's no doubt that there were doctors teaching in Ravenna in the ancient style of public lectures because we have the notes taken by one of the medical students who said, and I heard this great doctor Agnellus speak um, and teach me about Galen in, the, in his lectures. So these are the ways we can see how lively the culture was in Ravenna, infused by the very multifarious different uh, influences from the East Mediterranean. Can we go back to the buildings? Uh, because we are lucky enough to be able to visit the churches, some of them still, aren't we? Yes. Uh, but just describe the palaces. Was there a predominant style? Was there, uh, how would you if, you, if people have been to other cities in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, is there somewhere where they can see things which were like the palaces in Ravenna or were they so unique? In Rome, we have uh, remnants and, and ruins of the palaces of the great Roman emperors going back many, many centuries. So we know that Constantine built enormous, gigantic uh, palaces. Um, by the time we get to the fifth century, the emperors are not trying to build on such a vast scale, but they undoubtedly did have a very large area which was devoted to palaces and imperial occupation. I mean, courtyards, uh, barrack rooms, uh, workshops, then the actual accommodation for the emperor and the empress and all their servants. Very, very, a very, very large area. And it was excavated in the early 20th century when it was discovered that the water level was literally centimeters below the soil. And therefore, everything was waterlogged. And the way that the excavation was done did not reveal very much. And it has been reconstructed by very painstaking study of the early 20th century reports. But sadly, there isn't very much to give us a sense of the style. We can suppose from the 
depiction of a mosaic, which is called palatium, so it's supposed to be an image of a palace, that there were courtyards uh, with arcades, probably round squares, and that the emperor or king in this case appeared in the central part of the, of the uh, courtyard, enthroned on his throne, holding his spear and, uh, and, and orb of power, and that the courtiers, courtiers or, or his court stood around him and we know from the, this mosaic that some of them were hailing the, the emperor and others were pointing to the uh, depiction of Christ at the end of this church, which indicates that the image of the Palatium, which was faced by another with the image of the port of Classe. These were the two great monuments in cities that had been very well fortified and even the walls are shown. So there is a notional idea of urban architecture and people have tried very hard to identify the buildings that are actually depicted. Um, but basically we can see two major cities um, portrayed in this church of Santa Polinare Nuovo as it's now called. And we can actually witness um, the destruction of the Gothic decoration, which showed King Theodoric as he was effaced because his image was taken away and some of the courtiers' hands and feet were left. But nonetheless, that was because the church uh, of the Goths had adopted, was followed the Aryan Christian definitions. And when the uh, Byzantines reconquered uh, Ravenna, they insisted that the churches should be handed over to the Catholic community and the Catholic bishops uh, took over and redecorated. So but there what, are some wonderful mosaics to visit. So what can we learn, do you think? You're somebody who spent nine years and um, and your interest in Ravenna goes back much further than that. Um, but, you're, but nine years living presumably in Ravenna in your head. Um, what are the things that you think uh, would be wonderful to, to resurrect? What are the things that you think we could say that really worked brilliantly? One of the things that does appear to have worked very, very well in the early sixth century was that under the king, the Gothic king Theodoric, his Gothic community that had actually marched all the way from the, from the East Mediterranean on a long, long, long march um, with women and children and uh, all their cattle and everything, that that great migration brought a, a relatively small number of Goths into a densely populated part of Italy. And they constituted a minority and they were Aryan Christians. So they were committed, they were denounced as heretics by bishops of Rome, for example. So there was always, they were always clearly identified as something different, both by their language and their dress and their religious beliefs. Although when we look at the churches that they built and the decorations of the churches, it's quite clear that they too believed that baptism was the moment of entry into the Christian community and death should be followed by proper ceremonial burial. And their bishops were clearly um, leading a community in exactly the same way as the Catholic bishops. But these two parallel groups had to coexist. And one of the things that Theodoric was famous for was that he said, I, I, I don't agree with your beliefs, but I cannot force you to believe other than what you think, because that is your right. And this notion of a tolerance extended to the Jewish communities, and we know there were Jewish communities and synagogues in Ravenna, as in nearly all Italian cities, because there were many, many Jewish communities. But of course, later in the Middle Ages, the Jews were picked on and scapegoated and there was a much greater degree of intolerance. And I think if we look back to something that was very valuable in Ravenna, it was the ability to coexist, to, to, in, to integrate both these two traditions, the Germanic and the Roman, to insist that two groups of people could live together without constantly fighting, to respect the views of others, and to issue law codes, which made it possible for the Goths to settle their differences in a Gothic court in the Gothic style, and the Roman, i.e. the local Italian people, to settle their differences in the imperial Roman courts in the Roman style. 
And these systems, which existed elsewhere as well, but were very much more developed in Ravenna. And I think they gave the city that notion of a multicultural civilization, open to all sorts of influences, ready to accept difference and to get along with neighbors. And of course, there must have been a lot of fighting. We, we read that the, there were even fights between two regions of the city, the people who lived in, near one gate attack the people who lived near another gate and that sort of thing. But given that the whole of this early period of medieval history was so devoted to warfare and fighting out problems rather than settling problems by discussion, I think that's a lesson that we could all take with, from Ravenna in the sixth century. You think there's anything we can learn from the beauty of the place. I think that's what strikes me uh, looking, at, looking at the pictures and, and reading the book that it, it was extraordinary, like so many Italian cities, but just so extraordinarily beautiful in a way that of course, English cities certainly weren't. No, the, 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 the Roman style of mosaic floors, which is found all over England and all over the West and all over North Africa um, did not, necessarily progressed to the interior of churches in the same to the same degree and in Ravenna partly because it was the imperial capital and patrons wanted the very best they would employ the most skilled craftsmen to decorate their churches first to build them and then to decorate them so we have ex very very large monuments and very unusual structures and ne nearly all built in brick which is the main building material made in Ravenna, produced in Ravenna uh, to this day. But then inside, they wanted to have all the, 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 the walls and the apse and the roof covered in mosaic. And they chose to put golden mosaic on the, on the background rather than the white background of floor mosaics in the Roman style. So there was a qualitative change to something very, very brilliant. And because everything was lit by candlelight and not very many windows and lamps and so on, these, the, the gold attracted a lot of light and glinted it, gold and silver mixed in with it. And this was a very, very special art form, which allowed the brilliant colours of the decorations of the Old Testament scenes, sacrifice of Isaac and the uh, meeting of Abraham with the three angels and so on. All those scenes then become very, very much more vivid because the gold contrasts with the greens and the blues. And it is a, an amazing palette, which is formed not just of stone marble fragments, but lots of glass and then lots of painted glass so that it's actually, you can choose which which color you want to put beside. I mean, the mosaicists must have been so skillful and they hung from these, these wooden structures, I suppose, in order to do the, 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 the roofs and the, and the upper walls. It must have been quite frightening, <laughs> but it's a great, great achievement. And, uh, and fortunately it survives. So you can actually see it in Ravenna. Judith, thank you very much indeed. This has been absolutely fascinating. And may I just point out that the book, Ravenna, capital of empire crucible of Europe, um, is available through a link at the bottom of this screen. Uh, and that this uh, recording uh, and other events from the Festival of the Future City will be uh, available uh, through our website and on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch them again. Um, and in fact, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see uh, very many events that we're doing both in person and online throughout the autumn. Judith, thank you very much indeed for taking us to Ravenna uh, and let's hope more people go and visit it. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.